When I started to study the intrarenal arteries some 25 years ago, I did not realize at that time that my discovery of their segmental pattern would lead to so many other questions. As the years went by, many of these questions were answered. The aberrant arteries and the nature of the renal circulation the importance of the mesonephric arteries and the blood supply of the horseshoe kidney all gradually fell into place. One problem, however, continued to baffle me. Why is the arterial system within the kidney segmental, but the venous system is not? Now this cast is typical of the arterial arrangement. the five arterial segments with no collateral circulation between them. The venous pattern, however, is quite different, for within the kidney there are two, or sometimes three, systems of longitudinal arcades set in parallel planes which are connected to each other by smaller and horizontal arcades at different levels. At first sight, there is no obvious connection between the arterial supply of the normal kidney and, say, the horseshoe kidney, until you look at their evolution. When the fetus is about five millimeters in length, arterial buds push out from the aorta into the nephrogenic mass to supply the primitive glomeruli of the mesonephros. As the fetus lengthens, the more cranial of these arteries begin to degenerate, even before those at the caudal end have reached their maximum development. In the thoracolumbar area, a number of important structures are developing. The adrenal, the gonad, and the future metanephros. As all these organs demand a blood supply, and because this combined process of formation and degeneration of the mesonephric arteries makes it difficult for each new organ to be supplied individually, the arteries form a network, a type of common market, from which each organ will draw its requirement. As time goes on, many of the mesonephric arteries which supply this network will disappear if the area which they have previously supplied is taken over by a neighboring route. This process of supply and demand will largely decide which mesonephric artery will enlarge to become the renal artery of the adult kidney. None of this, however, explains why the intrarenal venous system has a free anastomosis from end to end nor by what process the venous arcades have been formed.
My son once said, my father's delight in rambling over antique rubble is almost as peculiar as his fascination by the kidney. And yet it was this interest in archaeology which gave me the clue to the mystery of the intrarenal veins. One summer, when we were on holiday in Greece, I spent some time exploring the excavations of the Minoan palaces on the island of Crete. On the southern shore lies the great palace of Phaistos. In recent years, exploration in the southwest part of the site has revealed something of great interest. Beneath the foundations of the present palace, which itself is 2000 BC, lies evidence of an earlier palace, and beneath this in turn, remnants of an older and probably Neolithic building. As I wander down towards the sea, thinking about this sophisticated and artistic Minoan society, which lived 4,000 years ago, there came to me the glimmerings of an idea. If successive generations of man, as a creative creature, tend to build upon the same site and to use the same building materials as their predecessors, then might not the very constituents of man himself, and particularly his kidney, tend to do the same thing? As in archaeology, perhaps I should carry out a renal dig and try to scratch below the surface of our present human civilization and look into our evolutionary past. Although phylogenetically, the three kidneys appear successively in the higher vertebrates, like the three palaces at Phaistos, they tend to overlap one another, both in time and in space. In man, the life of the pronephros is short, for it degenerates soon after the mesonephros starts to appear. There is, however, an important point in this common theme, for the intrarenal venous system and its arcades is a composite affair, and like the Minoan palace, it contains functional elements from more than one stage of evolution in its final structure. On either side of the developing mesonephros are two major longitudinal veins. The posterior cardinal on its posterior lateral border, shown in orange, and the subcardinal on its anterior medial side, shown in blue. At first, only the posterior cardinal has any connection with the heart, but both veins are connected cordially to each other and to the great caudal vein, which receives blood from that part of the fetus. Later, the subcardinal vein on the medial side of the mesonephros joins with its fellow and makes connection with the heart through what will eventually become the inferior vena cava. About the same time, small anastomotic channels begin to form between the posterior and subcardinal veins across the substance of the developing mesonephros. Further changes now occur in the two great veins. The posterior cardinal no longer drains to the heart and the subcardinal loses its connection with the caudal vein. The loss of these two connections inevitably forces a large portion of the venous return to cross the mesonephros in order to reach the heart. Provided, of course, that the small transverse anastomosis between the great veins can enlarge to carry the load. Unfortunately, this they cannot do. 
for by now the mesonephric tubules are developing and are occupying that vital space. At first, the developing tubules probably only deflect the transverse channels. But later, as the tubules increase and occupy more space, they stimulate, at first, the formation of more horizontal channels. And later, as the pressure increases, the development of ascending and descending branches. These will unite to form a longitudinal and horizontal network and so produce a collateral circulation within the kidney between the two cardinal veins. The last stage in this story is brought about by the disappearance of the connection between the posterior cardinal and the great caudal vein. And because the posterior cardinal vein has now no connection at either of its ends, it will itself disappear and leave only the horizontal anastomotic vessels and their ascending and descending branches within the kidney. This study provides an explanation for three facts which previously were perhaps not fully understood. One, it can account for the longitudinal and horizontal venous arcades within the kidney and for the free circulation among them. Two, it explains the close proximity of the intrarenal veins to the pelvic calycine system and the ease with which the so-called pile of venous backflow can occur. This, of course, is really a traumatic passage of radio-opaque dye from the calices into the thin-walled veins which lie around them. A similar rupture has been produced experimentally in this cast. Finally, it provides a reason for the existence of the occasional vein which passes from the cortex on the lateral border of the kidney into the perinephric fat. This solitary vein is probably an archaeological remnant of a transverse anastomotic channel, which, in the final dissolution of the posterior cardinal vein, has escaped destruction. And like some ancient waterway, although stripped of its former glory, is still in use.